So we're going to finish talking about what we started this morning. I debated within myself whether to go back to an old topic or whether this one uh, still had useful things that were not repetitive. And I think this is fine. We'll just finish this and, uh, well, I think we'll finish it. So that part's good. The uh, discussion is how to serve under elders. And the reason for asking that question is because there is thought that we uh, ought to appoint elders, which is a reasonable thought, of course. And um, one of the things that occurred to me was, well, one of the things that maybe needs to be done that hasn't maybe been addressed as clearly or as often is what it means to follow um, under the leadership of elders. Some have said followership or something. I, don't, I have not come up with any good coins um, that I like anyway for that. But basically, we do need to know how to work with uh, leaders and how to be subject to them. And so serving underneath elders is the idea, underneath in the sense of spiritual authority in the local congregation. And... Uh, the thing we left to talk about this afternoon is the decision-making of the elders, the binding of judgments. Earlier today, we did make some reference to this, and I'll remind you that it's true. Elders are making judgments. There are many matters of judgment in any local congregation that must be addressed, and there has to be a decision reached and a decision made, and that decision has to be the way, or has to become the way in which we will fulfill that command. As an example of this that is rather simple, we can take the meeting, the meetings, the meeting times of the assembly. We are commanded in Scripture to meet on the Lord's Day. That is, on the first day of the week, you can see that they did this. There is no further specificity than this, which is telling us that we can meet at any particular time of day. There is also no indication that we are prevented from meeting more than once on the same day. And in fact, if you look at their practices in the book of the Acts, it kind of looks like somebody was around kind of all day, and people came and went as they were able to do so. They were a slave economy after all. But um, that time frame is something that is a judgment. Do you meet at nine in the morning? Do you meet at noon? Do you meet at seven in the evening? You know, whatever it might be. That's a judgment call. The scriptures do not bind when you meet in terms of time. And so um, when a congregation decides and sets, this is when services will be, that is a judgment. And that judgment has been made. Now, once the congregation says, this is when we are assembling, well, that's when we are assembling. Uh, you know, if, if we assemble at high noon, 12 noon, <laughs> you can't come in at 9 a.m. or p.m. and leave at 10 a.m. or p.m. and say, well, I assembled. Not everybody else was there, but I was there on the Lord's Day. And I met my responsibility. No, no, you didn't. Because the assembly of the saints is scheduled. And in the case of, let's say, we're setting it at noon, well, you, you got to be here at noon if you're going to be assembled with the saints. You can't come from 9 to 10 in the morning and say, well, I assembled. Nobody else was there, but I got my thing in. Uh, you know, the meeting place, whatever that decided upon location might be, is not holy is not touching base, you know, not punching the clock or punching your ticket, for those of you who are familiar with riding trains in the Northeast. <laughs> um, that's not what's happening. When they decide to meet, that's the time that the assembly is, and that's the time that you are to be there if you're going to be assembled. 
And it's true sometimes things happen to where uh, this time isn't going to work for everybody for various reasons. Their typical schedule is such they are not awake at that time or they have some medical condition that must be on schedule and they will be connected to a machine or a needle or something at that time. Okay, these things do happen. It's true. And so, a, you know, a faithful stewardship, a faithful leadership in a local congregation will take pains to know about such matters and make sure that the there is an available time for that person or that group of persons to be able to assemble. That's very reasonable and is a matter of judgment as well, but it is indeed a matter of judgment that is well within the purview of the authority of an eldership to say, well, we are going to meet twice because we expect that at some times some people can come, at some times other people can come. If you can make both of them, great. If you cannot make both of them, that's why we have two. Um, that is a very reasonable thing to do. I remember well, um, I went to a place, uh, well, it was Pruitt and Lobit in Baytown, and I really don't know, I mean, I haven't been there in a long time, so don't quote me on that. I, if they're out there saying, let's all worship the devil and doing an Easter egg hunt today, I don't know anything about that, okay? I'm not endorsing, I'm just saying, I went out there one time and I saw this thing, and I don't think that they are, I'm just saying. Don't take that as an endorsement, okay? I'm. It's just an example here of this thing that really did happen, which was, they asked me to come speak one Sunday, and I did, which I'm sure they regretted later. But at the time, anyway, it seemed like a good idea. And at the time, um, you know, they met at 9 or 9.30 in the morning, something like that, and they met at 7.30 p.m. Oh, wow, that's very unusual. That's pretty late. I don't care, but that's very unusual. Well, it turned out that in Baytown, um, you know, you if you have a job, <laughs> You work for an oil company. That's what you do. And uh, the oil companies had a shift and a second shift and a third. So what was happening was a very significant number of the congregation, I'd say roughly half um, and not 15 people, a large congregation, 100, 200 people, I don't know how many, but half of them were working that morning and not there that Sunday morning. They were all there Sunday night at 7.30 right after work. <laughs> and it was interesting. I realized, yeah, this makes perfect sense. Not everybody can actually get away, and it's all right. At the same time, that time might be difficult for others who have medical needs, whatever. Point being, it's judgment, isn't it? Nothing is actually bound about what time. We love one another. We're subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That's judgment. And they made a good one in that regard. At least as far as I can tell, that's a good judgment. Those are not bad people, you know, failure to be committed to God or whatever else. It's judgment what time you meet. All right. So that's an example of a thing that is a judgment, but it is a bound judgment. That's the time that we meet. And, and you, you come at that time or one of those times, or you're not assembled. It has to be like that. Um, another, perhaps, um, elementary or pedestrian example would be various things that we do as part of the worship service itself. So, you know, somebody has to lead singing. That's a matter of judgment. Not a matter of judgment that you have to worship God in song. That's not a matter of judgment. It's not a matter of judgment that you have to worship with uh, all things being done in decency and in order. That is not a matter of judgment. That's a commandment. It must be that way. How do you effect that result is a matter of judgment. We choose to use a single man who will, not unmarried, but an individual who will lead the congregation in singing. That is a very reasonable way to do that. 
it works fine. Whom do you choose? Well, it should be a man who is a faithful man, a, 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 you know, obviously a child of God, a, a, you know, somebody who is trustworthy to lead and direct our thoughts in song and worship to God, of course. But who is it going to be is a matter of judgment. Uh, you know, at the, in the, at the current moment, as I look around at who is assembled now, every head of household here is capable of leading singing. Which one of them is going to be the one who leads it? That's judgment. Who's going to do it? That's judgment. But one of them is going to do it. And that guy, he's going to be the leader. <laughs> if it's Malcolm, for example, I'm sorry that your name is now on tape. But if it's Malcolm, for example, and he gets up to lead singing, and I decide that I'm going to lead singing and start singing instead, that's disorder. That's not decency. That's not order. That's not subjection. In fact, that's out of subjection. And yes, men are capable of being out of subjection. Of course they are. That should be no surprise. <laughs> right? You can't just decide, well, you know what? I'm going to lead singing. I'm a man. I'm eligible to lead singing. Shouldn't I be able to lead singing? What, you're against me leading singing? No, 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 no. It's because the song leader at this service is Malcolm. Well, so that means I can't lead singing? Yes, it does. But it's a matter of judgment. It's a matter of judgment that has already been judged. Under due process, under no duress, in the absence of any issue or problem, in order to, to bring about the order and decency of the worship. So no, you will not subvert that. That is a sin to subvert that. It's out of subjection. It's evil, disorderly. If Malcolm selects number 375, and it's not a suggestion or anything, but if I just picked a number, if he selects number 375 and you think, you know, that's not the best song that we could sing at this point in time. I'm thinking about number 23. Well, you can't just start singing 23 when he gets up to lead. That's disorderly and out of subjection and indecent because it's not the plan. When he selects the song, that's the song you're going to sing. And you're welcome for the reminder. I didn't think to put a book over there. Sorry. <laughs> um, that's the one you're going to sing. Why? Because the Bible says thou shalt sing number 375. No, it doesn't. But because the Bible does say you will sing, you will do so with decency and order, and there will be authority in the local church. When that person is selected and that person is made the leader, that person leads. When you're put in charge, take charge. And you don't fight that at the time. Now, maybe you'll come up later after services and say, you know, I don't know if Malcolm should be leading singing. That's a totally different thing, and that's not out of subjection necessarily. I wouldn't say that to his face if I were you, but just kidding. Uh, <laughs> testing to see if anybody's paying attention, that's all. But truly, this is what we mean. It's a pedestrian example of a binding judgment. We do it all the time. That's all. We do it all the time. And the elders do this too. There are many areas of judgment. Just because a thing is, in fact, a matter of judgment, it could be done more than one way, does not mean that when a judgment is made, you get to fight about it and disagree and argue and refuse to do it. Uh-uh, it doesn't work that way. No, that's not how it works. When the judgment has been made, and it has to be made, that's what you're going to do, provided it's not a sin, of course. Because the Lord must be served with decency and order. Matters of judgment, nonetheless, have to be judged, and that judgment has to become binding. Otherwise, you do not have order, you do not have decency, you do not have leadership. 
That is a failure of leadership if you cannot make a decision and you are paralyzed by the fear of the weakest member. That's bad. So again, the song leader could be anyone, but it isn't. It could be any number of songs, but it isn't. It's the one who's been selected. It's the one that he has selected, right? A person who leads prayers. Any of us could lead prayers the same way as could lead singing. I mentioned earlier, any of the heads of household here is capable of leading a prayer. That's true. It could be any one of you, but it's not any one of you. There are individuals who have been named to that in this worship assembly, and that's what it's going to be. Right? And when David gets up to lead a prayer, I don't decide that I think I could lead a prayer. I think I could lead a prayer better than David. Right? So I'm going to lead one, and it's going to be better. Like, no, that's out of subjection. That isn't good. That's disorder. You don't do that. Submission out of reverence for Christ is what we're looking at in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine. It starts at 18. That's debauchery, but rather be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, submission out of reverence for Christ means that you don't go your own way in a matter of judgment. If you do go your own way in a matter of judgment, you're out of subjection. We are to be subject to one another, submitting to one another in reverence for Christ. That's all we're getting at. As I say, I understand that song leaders are a relatively pedestrian example. Sorry. A relatively pedestrian example. And prayer leader, that's a relatively pedestrian example. Uh, you know, for the most part, those things are pretty well trod, and people don't usually go their own way when it comes to that kind of a leadership. Fair enough, but the principle applies to the judgment calls that the elders make. Um, oh, let me go back for a minute here. Before we, yeah, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Before I move to the next thing here, again, the principle applies, and there are many calls of judgment, as in, you know, where are you going to meet? What time are you going to meet? Uh, you know, are you going to have microphones and PA systems? Are you going to have a recording? Are you going to have a website where you publish these recordings? Um, these are all matters of judgment. And the, the elders will eventually decide things like that, right? Or the men, in the absence of the elders, the leaders that there are are going to have to make that decision one way or the other. But we're talking about elders right now. They're going to decide whether you do those things because, again, a website is not commanded in Scripture. A recording is not commanded in Scripture. Loudspeakers are not commanded in Scripture. They're aids, I think, to an end, and that's good. People forget sometimes about expedient. They think expedient means something you're allowed to do. No. Expedient means it expedites something. What is being expedited? What is the thing you're supposed to do, you're commanded to do, that you can do faster or more easily because of this thing? This thing, then, is an expedient. That's the thing that expedites the commandment. If it's not something that expedites a commandment, you shouldn't be doing it. Because you're getting into business that's not your business for no reason. You know, silence does not equal authority. Uh, it doesn't say thou shalt not. That's not authority. The Baptist church is next door. That's not Bible authority, right? So don't forget, expeditious is the idea behind an expedient. We're getting something done. I do think that a website is a way of expediting the spread of the Word of God and the teaching of God's Word, right? That's why that was 
done. That's why that decision was made by the leadership that is here to have one, to keep one going. That's all that's going on there. Now, moving on, Acts 11. In these days, we talk now about the contribution for the saints that are needy in the local church there at uh, Judea in Jerusalem. Acts 11, 27, in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, verse 28 of Acts 11, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine over all the world, which did take place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. That is, not just the brothers, the brethren, the, the brothers and sisters. They're their siblings in the Lord. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. This is the account in Acts 11.30. <clears throat> First question would be, why to the elders? This is a physical need that the brethren in Jerusalem have. They're sending, the individuals who are not in Jerusalem have decided we should send some money to them to help them in the time of the famine, help them store things up, help them be able to acquire things. Because, you know, uh, that's just the way it is in this world. It's very rare that there's actually no supply available. Usually what happens is things become too expensive. <laughs> so you help brethren by sending them money. In this case, they sent it to the elders in order to assist the church local in Jerusalem, the churches from Corinth, from Rome, from Ephesus, Galatia, wherever. They sent money to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Why do the elders? Isn't it a physical need? Well, yes, but the fact is that the treasury and the, the, the money in the local church is governed by spiritual principles, which means it first is in the purview of the elders. Now, the elders do appoint deacons, and they appoint deacons to do a lot of the work that is to be done with the treasury. That's where Act 6 comes in, when they're doing this daily distribution for the widows who are enrolled. They are doing so uh, with treasury money, and the elders have overseen that, if you will, in part by asking questions of the deacons and checking in on them, but in part because they they invested the deacons with that authority for that work and sent them going. So yeah, it goes to the elders. They're going to have to decide. But the other thing that's interesting about that is it's telling you the elders are boots on the ground. They, the elders of the local church are kind of the interface to the outside world for the local church. If you're sending money to that to help the saints in that place, you don't send it to the saints directly, you send it to the elders of that church, expecting that they are trustworthy custodians of the funds being passed through, and expecting that they are uh, also trustworthy in the Spirit to know the congregation and the congregation's needs so that they know how it should be distributed locally. It isn't the business of another congregation to know those matters about the members in Jerusalem. It's the business of the elders in Jerusalem to know those matters. You know, if you look back in Acts 4, what it said there in Acts 4, 34 and 35 was, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need, which is the establishment of a treasury. It's saying there was this ongoing presence of money with which to meet any need that might arise over time. That's really what's happening there in Acts 4.35 and uh, 34, 34 and 35. And where is it? It's at the apostles' feet. The treasury is under spiritual oversight. Even though, yes, it is being used, obviously, for physical 
purposes, physical needs, it is being spiritually governed. It is under the leadership of the elders, and it always has been. The apostles were the first elders, as evidenced by Acts 6. <clears throat> and if you're interested in such nerdery, I will tell you again in Acts 6 that what it literally says there is it is not good for us to leave off the word of God in order to serve as deacons. That's literally what it says. And so they appoint these seven husbands. It says pick out seven husbands from among you, by the way, not men, not persons, husbands. <laughs> but uh, that's another lesson for another time. My point in, in noting it is just that they were leading. The, the elders or the apostles, they were leading. They were determining how this would be done and setting that into motion and it's a spiritual governance it's a spiritual decision about what needs to be supported it has always been at the feet of the apostles which is to say we're all governed by the word of god in this regard we have to use the word of god to do these things So here at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 3, let's talk a little bit more about sending money. Here is how they did it. <clears throat> what we read earlier in Acts 4 is that it was stored up so that when a need arose, they could meet it. And that's the pattern you're seeing in 1 Corinthians 16. Every week, you give as you've prospered so that there is a store, there's a treasury. And that way when Paul comes, he's not holding out his hand and passing around the hat looking for donations. You have a treasury with which to meet this need. And then you send whatever in your judgment as a congregation or as an eldership is the appropriate amount or portion, percentage, whatever, to send. He says to them at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 16, 3, when I arrive, that is Paul, when I, Paul, arrive in Corinth, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go too, well, then they will accompany me to Jerusalem. All right, so first of all, the intent is, oops, let's stop there too. First Corinthians 16, 3, the intent is, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. That's interesting. It's telling us the church there, and you know, this is pre-Western Union, pre-ACH transfers, right? This is a time when if you were going to send money, you were literally going to put it in a sack on some dude's back, and he was going to get on a boat and go take it. <laughs> so you got to be careful, very, very careful there. Um, I don't know if it's any more than we have to be today. We can talk about Internet security later. But um, you get the idea. They have to be accredited. They have to be trustworthy to carry this all the way back and to get there with the same amount as they started right? <laughs> you get the idea. Now, despite this, what we would probably call a tight chain of custody in the transit of that money from the treasury at Corinth, in this case, to the eldership or the treasury at Jerusalem, the fact is it got sent to the elders at Jerusalem. This is a thing that I point out because there is a tight chain of custody for this gift in transit to ensure that it arrives with full fidelity, meaning it is what they sent, it's what they intended to send, it is all of it, not missing a penny. And this will be, you know, duly noted and shown to be the case and information will get back to the sender. That's all that's getting that they're getting at here. 
And as Paul said, I can also certify they can go with me. Just offering to help. But what's interesting for me here is that despite that chain of custody, the gift is handed to the elders at the receiving end. Meaning, the church at Corinth is not in control of where that money goes within the church at Jerusalem. The elders at Jerusalem are in control of where that money goes within the church at Jerusalem. That's all. That's the only point I'm trying to get at here. Other churches do not get to earmark money or pass through money to individuals or families. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to send aid for the saints in Jerusalem, in the New Testament, for example, then it goes to the elders. And if we had that situation today, and I think we probably do, we've been talking some about Nigeria and the extreme need of the brethren there. If there's any way to help them, and I don't know that there is, but if there is, and we find out that there is a faithful eldership to whom we can send funds and that this will actually help faithful Christians, well, then that's what we'll do. But we won't be in control of what happens to it once the elders get it. The elders are expected to know the situation on the ground better than anybody else does. That's how it should be, and that's exactly right. Why would we think that we know better from over here? This is a matter of judgment. How to distribute the funds is a matter of judgment. They have to know the people. They have to know the situation. They have to know their own uh, treasury, the prospects of what will come into that treasury, what they can support, what they can sustain. Right, All of that is judgment, and that judgment, therefore, rests with the elders. Because where else should it go? What other body would be a better body to make those decisions and those judgment calls? If we're not going to do it God's way. Please tell me what the salient qualities of your way are, and what verse is that? Again, at Acts 6 and verse 3, in closing, another example of judgment is, who are the deacons? Well, the elders appointed the deacons. That's what happens in Acts 6. Fact is that they appoint the deacons. Six three of Acts, brothers, pick out from among you seven husbands of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So the brethren put forth the names of deacons, but the fact is, the elders appoint them to the duty. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on these. So yeah. This is a perfect example of judgment. It's not judgment that we should have deacons. The Lord does expect for the church to be ordered appropriately and to have officers. And every instance that you read about in the letters of the New Testament where they say something to the elders, greetings to them or to the church here with its elders and deacons is what you always see. Deacons come along with it. They always are doing this to be orderly. Because there is a lot of work to do. But the elder has to make the call. It's a judgment matter who is going to be a deacon. There might be multiple men who are qualified. Which ones is it going to be? Well, we put forward our nominations as members of the church local, but they decide from among these nominations whom it will be, and they appoint those men. Really, you could say, uh, this is the, the scriptural precedent at verse 3. Brethren, pick out from among you seven husbands, and we will appoint them. What that means is they solicit nominations from the church. And I think what that also means is today, elders who do not solicit nominations are not following the scriptural pattern. This is built in. It's baked into Acts 6 that this is how they did it. But it's also baked in that 
in the end, the final call has to be theirs. Somebody has to make that judgment call. It's going to be the elders. They're going to make that judgment call. So all this, again, is underneath that idea that they make decisions and they do make judgments and those judgments are binding. Just because somebody is nominated to be a deacon and is in fact faithful and qualified to serve, but if that person was not selected, that person is not a deacon. Because the elders make that appointment in the end. And it isn't a matter where you go and get your feelings hurt, like, I should have been a deacon. I'd have been a better deacon than that guy. You know, or whatever. That's how Satan works, man. That's how Satan works. Watch out. you got to understand that they have to make a call. Hard to know what call to make sometimes. And are they going to get some of these wrong? Probably. Their judgments. They do the best they can to pick a time that works for everybody, or they do the best they can to pick somebody who should be able to lead songs well, or who should be able to lead prayers well, or who should serve well as a deacon. It is possible that they're wrong about that, and something goes wrong. Of course it is. But the fact is, you're not going to come up with a better way to do it than God's way. If, if you select people who are experienced fathers, experienced husbands, who have led a life of faith, taught their children to obey the gospel, and this group of guys can't make a good, solid judgment call, well, who can? Can anything ever be decided? Can anything ever be settled? Can the church ever move forward? No. No, it can't. That's a satanic design, you see, to fight authority that God has rightly invested in the local church. So we don't need that. Got to think about what it means. They do have the ability to make decisions. And I may not even agree with those decisions sometimes <laughs> in matters of judgment. But recognizing that it is a matter of judgment and that the decision they have made is not a sin I choose to be subject to God and to abide by it. Go with this. Try to make this work. It's got to be possible that they see something I didn't see. They know something that I did not know or realize. And I dare say more often than not, that's going to be the case. No matter how smart you are, two is better than one. Three is a lot better than one. They're just gonna, they're just gonna have the ability, as a rule, to make better decisions as a council of elders, as opposed to one person. So yes, these are some of the principles that we bring forward with regard to serving under elders. We have to know how to do these things if they're going to succeed in working in the local place. We have to know how to do these things if we are going to see, succeed at being the people of God, as we are intended to be. Today, if you are not a Christian, become a child of God, that you might be forgiven of your sins, requires that you be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. In this, you are subject to the Lord God himself, and the blood of Jesus washes away every sin. We put to death the old person and are resurrected in Christ, but it is a real act of humility and it is a real act of subjection because you're being dunked under water. Perhaps by somebody you don't know all that well. But it starts that way. And things are like this from now on. We, we're subject to God the Father. And so we listen to his rules and we can accept that 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 God's way is is going to be the best way. And we're going to need to find a way to make our peace with that and live that way in the local church. So today, if as a Christian, you have not been doing right in that matter, repent, make things right with God. If in some other thing you have been overcome 
we're glad to pray with you for you. That you might be restored to him based on your repentance as a Christian. So if we speak today and you are not a Christian, be baptized in his name. If we speak and you are a Christian and need the prayers of the saints, either way, either way, please let us know how we can help in the spirit by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song collectively. 